Glory be to God. Welcome to D Weaver Art. I'm so glad to see you guys again. I'm grateful for you all watching this video again as far as me, D Weaver Art. Listen, it's a new year. It's 2023. Happy New Year to all my viewers and subscribers. I'm so blessed to have a special guest with us today. All the way from Colorado. He just recently moved there. And so... um before we go with him, I want to encourage you guys, if you're new to the Weaver Art uh, channel here on YouTube, I urge you to subscribe. And also, don't forget to hit the notification bell in which you can receive instant alerts on new content and material. And I want to apologize to you guys because I know y'all been having some, probably some withdrawals from not seeing my videos being posted for the past couple of months. I've been working. I'm not a full-time artist yet. But I'm getting there. Listen, I just want to thank you guys for supporting me and your your views and your likes and subscriptions mean a lot to me. And I appreciate that. And I hope I can produce more content in 2023. And uh, with that being said, let's get back to our special guest all the way from Colorado, who is a painter, an artist. His name is Phil Bob Borman. And he specializes in realism, particularly skyscapes like clouds and particular storm clouds like cumulonimbus. And if you are a weather junkie or a weather enthusiast like me, you're going to love this, this artist uh, broadcast. And let's just say he likes revealing his passion from the sky. It's something about gazing up and looking into the heavens, you know, such a beautiful, uh, works of God's hands that we see from the sky and even on the ground here on earth. But um, I want to share with you guys uh, our special guest, Phil Bob Borman. I, and enough of me talking right now. Phil, you just share with the audience who you are and um, what you specialize in. Oh, well, thank you, D. And, uh, and Happy New Year to you. Uh, well, uh, my name is Phil Bob Borman, and I've been... I've been an artist for the last 40 years. Uh, I started out uh, doing, I was a, a bronze artist. I did that for 15 years and then laid out and went into full-time ministry for about 10. And then since 2005, I have been painting and uh, I wanted to get back in my artwork and the Lord said, start painting. And I said, okay. And, and so I've been painting uh, skies. Really, that's my passion. I want to paint. God's glory one sky at a time. And so I've been doing that ever since then. I've got a, a Bachelor of Fine Art uh, in Art from Sol Ross State University in uh, Alpine, Texas, back in the 80s. And I've been to a bunch of workshops. I have several mentors that have taught me through the years. And uh, I just can't learn enough. But in a nutshell, that's me. Well, this... That is great to know and great to hear. And as me being a follower of you on Instagram, because that's how I actually got a chance to meet you on Instagram. I connected with you when I first saw some of your, your paintings on Instagram really captured my attention. I was really uh, blown away by the structure of your paintings of these clouds and stuff. But what I failed to realize, I did not know that you was a minister. That is great to know. I mean, you had uh, was you are tell us a little bit more about your connection from or your journey or your connection with art and ministry. All right, you bet. Well, um, gosh, I guess it would be thirty years ago, sometime around in there, twenty five years ago. Um, I was working on a sculpture, and I uh, and. It was one of those sculptures. Everything was going great. I mean, it was like, oh, look at this. And it was just, it was a, it was Phil Bob's opus kind of a deal. And, uh, but I kept getting this belly ache every time I started to work on it. And so I called my pastor and he was, uh, he's kind of black and white type of feller, you know, just no beating around the bushes. And I said, I said, Floyd, I, every time I'm working on this sculpture, if, you know, I get a bellyache. And he said, well, it could be the Holy Spirit talking to you. And I said, well, what should I do? And he said, listen. And then he hung up the phone. 
<laughs> and so I went to, to pray in and I looked at my sculpture and I said, Lord, but look how I've done this and look how I did this and look how I did this. And, and I went, oh, my word. Every one of those sentences started with a personal pronoun, I. And I realized that my artwork meant so much to me. It meant too much to me. And so I, I said, Lord, I don't want this to come before me and uh, or between you and me. And I was doing, you know, I had said a couple of years before, I said, I'll do anything God wants me to do so long as I get to do my art. And that night I gave it all up to him and I cut that sculpture up into little one inch pieces and gave up my artwork for 10 years. And ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to be in ministry. And so uh, as the Lord does it, he just, I went into full-time ministry that, uh, that year and I had a bunch of mentors and I was associate pastor, worship leader, youth leader, you know, kind of every stuff. And then I went to circuit preaching uh, for the New Mexico Junior Rodeo Association. And I've got my own uh, ministry. It's a front porch ministries. And I would, I'll put together youth groups all over New Mexico and Texas. And, uh, and then I was a pastoral minister. I was a, a, a counselor, a pastoral counselor for ministers. So I would counsel ministers from all over the world. And, um, and then, so, and now, um, I, I preach different places. Um, you know, when people ask me to do weddings or funerals, uh, play music at revivals, play music for people, I write songs, I preach, and I just listen for my name. And so that's really where I've, you know, kind of where I'm at right now, my ministry. And I've, preached at just about every denomination out there. Mm. Wow. That is, um, that is very interesting. And um, for our viewers out there, I don't know if you all could uh, relate to the fact, um, particularly you artists out there, within every artist, there's that element of pride. And when we all have that pride about ourselves and, 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 and even though a majority of us as artists, we're very sensitive about our work, but deep down inside, there is an element of pride about us too. We do, we do take a personal pride about our work and so forth. And, um, and you were saying, look what I, look what I, that personal program, pro pronoun I, because if you put two more letters to I on each side, which is S and N, you get sin. You mm -hmm. know? And so even though God had blessed you to be able to sculpture and stuff, he still wanted to be first. He still wants to be first in all of our lives and stuff. And that's very, um, uh, very humbling to hear that from you. And me personally, I'm going to be honest with everybody. There, I've had an interesting journey where I grew up wanting to be an artist. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to draw and paint. Mainly I started out drawing more than I did painting, but I had took art, excuse me, I was phone going off, but I went, I've, I've always had the desire to just want to do what I love and get, and just live off of that. And I still have that same passion. I still have that desire, but you know, life comes with a lot of detours. I wouldn't say interruption, but detours. There's a lot of things that we're on this journey. We're on this path called life. And there are things that um, just happen. Things happen, uh, connections with people. And uh, to make a long story short, I gave my life to Christ when I was about, truly at that time, it was around when I was about 20 years old. Yeah, I had grew up going to church and my parents would faithfully take me to the house of the Lord. But um, at that time, I really didn't, I didn't care about the things of God or so forth. And I basically, because the reason why my heart wasn't right, my heart was full of sin. My heart was full of darkness. I didn't know the purpose that God had for me. 
And then one day I was somewhere where I had no business being in an adult. Uh, when I say an adult setting, it was, I'm like, I'm young adult, but it was in a place where I shouldn't have been. And there was a, some, a bad commotion that took place and gunshots fire. And the next thing you know, um, a couple of minutes later, I had a gun pointed to my head. I really, this is a lot of people are watching this for the very first time, or maybe you saw this or watching this video now for uh, so many times, it's really intrigued you out of all the videos that I've posted on my uh, art channel here on YouTube. But I believe that the audience need to know the, the purpose of why we are here. And that's not for ourselves, it's to glorify God. To make a long story short, I gave my life to Christ, was baptized. And um, so what I sense, and it's hard to interpret, but I, I sense that there was a calling on my life. It's kind of, it's like a own working thing with me now. Um, I fell in love with the word of God at the moment I really got truly saved. I fell in love with the word of God. And I, until this day, I still love God's word. Amen. And life can, life can be full of uh, pulls and distractions and stuff. And uh, at this moment, mm -hmm. this is where I'm at. I'm doing my creations. Mm -hmm. I'm doing my best to make sure that uh, I have a message behind my art or about what I do that will bring, that will take the audience to, who they really need to focus on. And that's not me, not themselves, it's not others. It's mainly him, the Lord. And I know other people who are watching this that are in the art world don't have a religious faith. They don't believe or they do believe. They may be of a different persuasion or a different type of uh, belief, but that's okay because God doesn't, he looks beyond that. And he can even look beyond our sin to the point where he loves us so much that he didn't want us to, be uh destroyed in our sin but he does right. want us to know him and so mm -hmm. um this is an interesting um uh interview and i i want to thank you for sharing that part because viewers need to hear that that you can be of the lord and be an artist at the same time and so um i will say this there was a period of time from the time i got saved up until probably mm, 2000, right at the beginning of the century, the new century, um, I, I I was doing my artwork, and then I just stopped for about a total of nine years, maybe, and I did no artwork at all. And I just concentrated mm -hmm. on, on ministry. I was at a local church working with youth and different things like that. And um, so... One day when I was at work, happened to be where I'm currently working at now, there was a, a gentleman that came in and I, I think I had seen him before. And, and what I failed to realize and didn't, didn't know, I knew he was a minister. I knew he was a preacher, but I did not know that he was an artist. And so he had... Um, he had some paintings that he shared with me. And so I was like blown away. I was just really, I didn't know that about him and neither did he know something about me that most of a lot of people at that time didn't know that, that in my life that was currently in my life, didn't know about me that, that I had, I had a great interest in art and mm -hmm. it kind of, kind of waned on me. It was still there, but it, it just like, I just, so with me, it's kind of reversed. You, you're, right. you know, me. I'm, I'm more focused in it. But then I, I don't forget my, old, my ultimate purpose is to glorify Him. And, sure. and so in Ecclesiastes say, whatever you do, do whatever your hands get to doing, do it with all your might. And then Ecclesiastes say, whatever you do in word, drink, do it all to the glory of God. Amen. And so if it doesn't bring God glory, we don't need to be doing it. And right. so the main, like I, like I said earlier, the main purpose, the main focus is him. So let's move on. Um, I want to ask you, how did you get started in your art? So tell us that 
your journey as far as your art and your education behind it. Okay. Um, I started drawing when I was a little kid. And uh, I remember uh, when I was four, I drew all those golden books, and it, you know, kid's book with the bi golden binding on them. There was a picture of a, a dolphin, and I remember drawing it. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And when and I was always drawing on on the windowsill, on the wall, you know, and of course I got in trouble for that. And then when I was 14, I came home one night from uh, I was working as a busboy at a restaurant and me and my buddy, we stayed up all night long. We we're talking and I was drawing and I drew until daylight. And I told him, I said, I'm going to be an artist one of these days. And you know how the good Lord always does it. You know, he, it's, it's not distractions. Our, our life is kind of like a river, you know, it, it might be a North flowing river, but it may be meander South a time or two, but he has always had me in artwork and, uh, and doing doing art. And then when I got to college, um, I was, I was always, even I was a, an ag major and animal science major and even though i was doing that i was still doing my artwork and then when i transferred to sol ross i said i want to i want to get a my education in art and so i was still in horse science and and then went to doing artwork and uh my mentor who was my art teacher uh i would bring drawings to him every week and you know, my whole thing is uh, really it's the pursuit of excellence, you know, and if it doesn't take any more to do it right than it does to do it wrong. And, you know, he would look at a piece and I'd bring it to him, be 18 with 24 uh, pencil drawn. And and I said, well, what do you think? And he'd say, he'd move his hands, you know, kind of like that in one little area. And he'd say, well, that looks flat right there. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, there's a whole lot of it that doesn't look flat. And I said, why can't you talk about that? And then he said, well, are you finished? I said, heck no, I got to finish that one little part that looks flat. And, you know, and he kept pushing it and he kept pushing me and saying, uh, give me a reason for looking at your artwork. And, um, and so, you know, don't do safe art, do what comes from your heart. And so I was doing that and, and I've done a lot of other occupations through the years while I'm doing my artwork. And I remember uh, I know when I was a government trapper, uh, my our troubleshooter came in. He said, Phil Bob, what do you want in life? I was 27 at the time. I'd already got my bachelor's in art and I was sculpting. And I said, well, I said, I said, I, I want a gal to say I do. I want to hear it's a boy and I want to paint clouds like John Constable. Well, at that time, you know, I was just single and running around and doing trapping and doing my artwork. Well, God gave me all three things and, and it was, Oh, let me see, probably 2005 or six. Um, going back with my, my art when I laid out for those 10 years in ministry, I was ready to lay out for the rest of my life. But then one day I had a studio that the ministry gave me when I was counseling and everybody said, Phil, Bob, you need to get back into this. God gave you this gift. And I said, Nope, I gave it up. I gave it up. And then one day, and you know how his sheep know his voice. One day the Lord said, start painting. And I said, okay. And that's when I started. And now the Lord and I have a large time every day in the studio. And, and I realized that my passion was painting clouds and skyscapes and showing, it may sound canned, but it's the truth is that I want to show God's glory one sky at a time. And as an artist, you're anonymous. I mean, people know your work, but they don't know you. And so I was, I remember standing in the gallery that I was showing in and someone would come up and say, I feel God's glory or I feel God's presence when I look at this painting. And 
that's that uh, that's my that's my desire you know and that and and your intent will always be seen if it were to glorify me it would be seen if it's glorify god then it, then that will be seen as well and so um also i have been taking a bunch of workshops from different artists uh over the years over the last 15 years and i also teach art uh, at the fredericksburg artist school i do workshops once or twice a year depending upon the year and so uh, does that answer pretty good you 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 did fine phil you did fine. all right it's just much has been said that needed to be said and uh, our prayer and our hope is that our viewers can be inspired and really left with a open heart about their journey, their art journey. You I bet. Mean, there's many artists out there that are pursuing the things that they're supposed to be pursuing, but unfortunately they may not know the Lord. And mm -hmm. um, we, we um, don't want them to be that way. We won't want it to be that way, but people have to find God for themselves, you know, and, yeah. uh, but we hope that this broadcast will leave you inspired and leave you open to and in touch with what your purpose is, your, your, why you exist, the tools and the, the tools and the instruments that he's, skills that he's gifted you are to help others absolutely and as artists that's what we do we're to help people you know with a, either if it's through a message through our art or an emotional uplift and just the fact that be able to communicate from a creative way that's just reflective about our creator if you think mm -hmm. about it we look at another human being and how they're fashioned and formed. There's no, nobody's the same. Everybody's fearfully and wonderfully made and unique, regardless of what their background is or where they come from. They're fearfully and wonderfully made by their creator and they have purpose, they have meaning. They may not know it, but they do. Yes. Their life is not a waste. You might be watching this video and you're feeling bad about yourself. You you're wondering how and and what why am I here? Why I'm going through all these struggles. Just want you to know there is one who took your struggles that you're going through right now, and he wants you to know that you're not alone. I took all your struggles that you're going through now for you. I took it upon myself and allow these struggles to draw you to me, said the Lord. I'm allow Allow my allow your struggles that you're going through, while how people can misunderstand you or people can mistreat you or people can um, do all kind of things. But if you think about it, we all have done something offensive, maybe not to others, but definitely to the Lord. Right. So that's 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 awesome. Phil, um, I want to um, go into your paintings. Okay. Briefly, very brief what you paint. Okay. Well, my primarily my subject matter is skyscapes. I love painting the sky, clouds, uh, even a clear sky, and then the relationship and how the ground reflects what's going on in the sky. And so that's prime. That's primarily what I love to do. Yeah. Keep. Keep. Okay. And that's. Um, and then also, you know, in with that is the relationship between the two, between the landscape and and the sky. I and a lot of times I will have um, uh, a low horizon line, so you're seeing mostly the sky. You know, in my, as far as my compositions go, and and when I have people or a house or something like that or a headquarters, I will um, I'll have those uh in there to give scale but still they are supporting actors compared to the sky all right well phil i tell you what i appreciate that i have an image before me of you standing in a vest and a cowboy hat and yes sir looks like i thought you were wearing boots but i think there's some i think they are boots but not your traditional cowboy boots 
But that's irrelevant. I want to say this. That picture, when I first saw it on Instagram, I thought it was pretty small, but I was blown away how big that is in scale. So can you explain to me about that mountain and that cloud? And what, what, uh, why did you paint that? All right. Well, um, and yes, I, to let you know, those are my hiking boots. I was, I was a foot back all day that day, so I needed something that would, wouldn't slip and slide around. And this is at the back of the Museum of Western Art. But why I did that? The, the painting is called His Abundance. And it is, uh, when I took the photograph, I was on top of Nogal Mesa in South Central New Mexico, looking at the uh, Sacramento Mountains. And it was a perfect day. It had just got through raining and, uh, and that cloud came up. Look, like we were gonna get some more. And his abundance, of course, in that country is rain. Rain means grass, grass means your cows get fed, you know, and all that. And, and I believe in there, there is a, it's also a, a poignant point uh, in the lower left hand, you can't see it from this image, but there's uh, in the painting itself, there's a, a feller, a horseback in the lower left hand part of the painting. And he's looking at the far distance um, in the lower right hand side of a bunch of cows, you know, and that's just a point, point to say, thank you, Lord, for this. And uh, so, but that's why I, that's where I used to live. I used to live right down the hill from where that picture was, where I took the photograph at. That was uh, pretty impressive because of the size. And, and just for our viewers, I'm just curious, how long did that take you? Um, if everything is going my direction, which doesn't happen as often as I'd like, uh, it probably takes me about two or three weeks. Oh, wow. Awesome. What kind of brush yeah. did you use? Uh, usually I use... Uh, but I get it through Jerry's Artorama called the Silver Brush Unlimited. And it's a bristle brush. And I use, uh, mostly I use flats because the more you wear it, you use them, they become filberts and then become brights. And so I, I just, I like the bounce of a flat. And, uh, but it's by a Silver Brush Limited. And their bristle brushes is what I use. And I, I think they're by Langnickel, I believe. Yeah, I noticed I'm looking at uh, a scene here of your um, your paint brushes, and it looks to me like some markings of color on a on a on a uh, on a napkin and a like a thing of water and most turpentine. Yes, turpenoid right there. And then so this photograph was actually taken from the back side of my palette. I would be standing on the other side of it. And okay. so what I, so while I'm, I'm painting, you can see the one brush laying across my, that little turpenoid yes. container. Okay. So that's the brush I'm using right then. And what I will do is when I, I put my brush into my paint then, or my turpenoid and then my paint, and then I'll dab it onto my paper towel to get the extra um, turpenoid off of there so I have more control over that stroke. Okay. Um, let's see. I see you got a palette with a bunch of color markings on it. So yes. I noticed your palette is uh, gray. Is there a Explain this palette, and I'm not talking about so much the colors, but the actual surface that it's on. Okay. Well, what I have is on the gray that you see, I like a gray because it's a medium color, a medium value, and then actually the colors will really stand out with a medium background. What I did was I used two squares of that indoor-outdoor carpet, and you know, those sample squares that you can get at the Lowe's or somewhere. And I said, well, heck, these will work. And then I got a, a piece of glass cut the size of those two squares because I like to paint big and I like to have a big area. So it's about a 32 inch wide uh, or 36 inch wide 
uh, deal by 18 inches. And, but that's what I, that's what I use the, the glass cause it's easy to work with. Um, but the gray, so I can actually see the intensity and the brightness of the cut and the value of the color. Awesome. Awesome. That's good to know for the artists that are out there watching. I don't know if they may have thought of that to kind of be curious of, to know what, what they were looking at. They knew was, I'm sure they knew it was a palette and so forth, but, but the, have more detailed information about it that, that's good for them to know. I notice here in this uh, painting, you pretty much got all the underpainting pretty much done. You going into detail, and now you put some highlights into the clouds. So, um, you know, I painted clouds before, and I struggle with even to now. But I think it's just like you do some a skill over and over again. Eventually, you get a hang to get the hang of it. You bet. So I notice your brush strokes. I want you to explain about the direction of your brush strokes and also the values in that cloud. And that's where I struggle with because sometimes my values can be too, too uh, contrasting instead of subtle and soft transitions and soft edges. So explain, explain to us about that. Okay. Well, in this photograph right here, what I'm doing is I, you can see on the very bottom of the painting with the red, you know, we've already talked about the toning. And then I do a mixture of deep um, ultramarine blue deep and just a little bit of alizarin crimson to make that dark color to do my drawing. And then what I'm working on now, I this is what I call my rough in. It's kind of like I try to get all the cows in the same pasture, but we're not quite to the pins yet. Um, I'm still even though I have my um, my subject matter up, I've got my design, I'm really painting shapes at this point. And it's, uh, and it's really a fun part because I, I get to, uh, there's really no rules. I can use big brushes and large strokes and I'm really just covering, trying to get the red covered at this point right here. And then, uh, after I, after I do this point right here. So in fact, on that day, uh, I was painted about 12 hours that day when I roughed in this piece. Um, I had all the red pretty well covered and then I let it dry for a day or so and I come back over and then I start working into clouds and, you know, like what it is instead of the shapes. Uh, you know, I don't know if that communicates right. Uh, but my back into my, more detail. Okay. So yes. And then I'm getting into, after I rough it in, get everything, you know, uh, well, you can see like in the, to the left of my elbow, that dark right in there. And then you see the, the white highlights above that. I go ahead and put my white highlights in and then I try to find my darkest dark and and I'm uh, I may not go all the way to the edges, but I'm trying to paint like the whole painting at one at the same time to get them so I can get that that color and value harmony. Yes. Uh, then, like where I you can see where I've got the brush at at this moment are the clouds back behind the the primary subject of these. Uh, uh, cumulus nimbus clouds in the foreground and what I my my uh, paint my brush strokes I tend to go back and forth and then down over the top so I'll kind of cross hatch and go back over and I'm, I'm constantly thinking about you know I don't want any texture showing because I'm painting you know humidity you know and so I want to keep it soft and one of the ways I so those clouds that I'm painting on right there, of course, further back. And what I do is I'll take a, my white and I'll add uh, a little bit of um, blue and red. So like the, the dark part of the cloud that you see in the foreground, that's just in the middle there. That is a, a, a mixture of 
of cadmium red light and ultramarine blue deep. And it creates a very, I would call, describe it as a dry purple. It's not too, it's not like a Barney purple. You know, it's not, if you were to mix alizarin, it would be too, too, too purple on there. I don't know how else to say it, but here it lends itself to a warm, even a gray. And you can add a little yellow to de-intensify it some, but I'll take a little bit of that red and blue and mix it with the white to push it back to make that white de-intensify the white to make it look like it's further back. And the blue, you know, because of the influence of the blue sky and the red to keep it warm in there. And uh, and like I said, primarily, I'm only using three colors on my palette. And, you know, I have white for value, cadmium red, I'm sorry, cadmium yellow light, cadmium red light, I keep alizarin to help make my darks, but so I, that's a secondary. And then I have uh, ultramarine blue deep. All of my secondary colors, my tertiary colors, I mix myself. Oh, wow. Listen, I'm just now noticing this in here that you have a large cumulonimbus cloud behind a smaller version of a cumulonimbus cloud. But this smaller version, which is to the left, yes, sir. A big version ver version of a painting. Both of them are paintings, I perceive, that you yes, have sir. done. And this is what I'm talking about, folks, that are watching this video. You see these clouds, and if you're a cloud lover, it makes you excited because the detail is, is incredible. And what... I, I just could sit there and look at these clouds for a long period of time and just imagine myself being there, actually just seeing it. And, and the fact that you draw, excuse me, you make these clouds huge. Anyway, these paintings can be start out small, I imagine, and then you uh, uh, enlarge them and maybe different variations. Of right. It. But for my sake, and I speak for other artists that are out there that are interested in painting clouds, and maybe you do cloud art, and you already know what you got to do and what you have to do. You're really well skilled in it. But for me, I want to get better at my cloud art because I have an interest in meteorology. I'm interested in storms, and I show it forth in, in, in my cloud paintings. And, of course, I like portraits. I like doing portraits. Mm -hmm. And I personally do plein air to help me become loose and quick with my, and help me be able to observe colors really well. But what I notice here, and I, 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 this is, this is one of the big questions I want to ask you is that subtlety of values. How do you, because sometimes you go to mixing these colors on a palette and, and then you go to painting them and they're like, Man, that's a big chunk in value, like two or three values. Uh, not two, that's not too bad, but about three to four or five values darker than the highlight, and it just it don't it don't mesh together. But I kept looking one day, I kept looking and studying, looking and studying at at actual cloud pictures, not paintings, but cloud pictures, and just squinting my eye to find those shapes and the value shifts. And what I come to realize that for most of the clouds, that's not much of a big value shift. So at the most, at maximum, probably three three value value differences from from a highlighted point of the cloud or, or a lighter version of the cloud. That's right. what I've learned so far. But are you always using a number four? Excuse me. Are you always using a flat brush or are you using a... a because flat brush, if you use a flat brush, they tend to leave a lot of marks. But with a, a filbert brush, which is round like a flat brush, but has a roundness at the top, you're able to blend really well. And you can even use the, the tip, load your brush up with paint and just dab the tip of the brush because it has a roundness, which gives you that the convection part of the cloud where it's bubbling up that effect. So just, just take it from there, man. Well, what I do like on the, I do use a round, you know, for like on my highlights and one of the ways that, and then I will uh, bring my dark up to that and then I'll work in between and feather it. 
one of the things I do a lot is so when I use around on my highlights, then I will take a soft brush like a sable. Um, I've got some uh, silver brush, ruby satin brushes that were actually acrylic brushes. And I use one of them. It's a real soft uh, synthetic brush. And I will pull that across, not parallel, but perpendicular to my edge. And I will pull it away from the cloud. And what that does is it softens that edge. And, and even if it pulls a little bit, I'm not trying to move very much pigment. I'm just barely, and not blending, but it's just kind of barely pulling it over. And that softens the edge and it makes it, you still got your, your impact of your high, your, of your highlight. Yes. But it, it, but it breaks it up to where it doesn't look so heavy. And, uh, and that, to be honest, that was probably one of the greatest treasures that I learned from uh, one of my mentors. Uh, it was Michael Workman. Now, he's out of Utah. And he showed me that. And wow, that was a game changer for me. Awesome. Now, let me ask you another question. Your cloud mm -hmm. paintings, are these photos that you have uh, uh, picked out or you compile other in other words, are these photographs from observations that you've seen out west where you live, or are there uh, uh, some inspired photos where you've kind of got some of the colors or the time of the day and then combined another idea of the shape of another cloud and made your own type of a uh, uh, reference point? The answer is, is yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I do all of that. I have, I mean, most of my work is from me being out in the field and taking photographs. It's, you, it's like plein air painting. As you well know, you feel the day. You can feel the heat. Uh, you can feel the moisture coming in. Um, you know, so there's something about experiencing it that you cannot substitute. I've been doing this for a long time, and I will... So when I see a photograph that either I've taken or people send me photographs, I have a lot of people that will say, Hey, just, I wanted to send this to you. I took a picture of this and thought of you. Well, then I use all those for reference and I understand what's going on. And sometimes if I'm doing a commission, somebody will ask me to do their property or their country at a certain time of day and then I will have different clouds on references that will help lend itself to that composition, you know, or a type of cloud. And almost all the time, I will change things up for composition. You know, it's because I'm not trying to render, I'm trying to tell a story. And if you were to look at the photograph and say, well, your painting looks nothing like the photograph, and then I say, praise God, because if you were to wait another minute in taking the photograph, it may look like this and it may not be exact, but it is correct to the type of cloud. If that makes sense. Well, like that. Um, I'm just curious, who are some of the cloud painters that you are being inspired by or artists oh. that, you, that has inspired you? Oh, Wow. Um, well, my, Michael Workman is one and, uh, his tonal approach to painting. And I like to do, to use that to build in layers. Uh, Wilson Hurley. I love his cloudscapes. Uh, John Constable, which I shared with you before, uh, with him, uh, uh, oh my word. Ed, uh, it was Edgar Payne. Um, his skies uh, really and I'm trying to get more towards this is uh, Thomas Moran uh, Albert Beardstadt yes uh, me with his paintings yes I just you know and they're and the way that they, they could bring things in subtly and I use a lot of glazes with my paintings and uh, Rembrandt um you know, I, D, I can see 
I know where I want to go in my painting. I mean, I have just barely scraped the paint off the tip of the iceberg with where I want to go. And my ideas inside of me, my direction is, it's still taters and water. It ain't quite soup yet. I'm, so I'm still growing and trying to figure out other ways to explain what I'm seeing and feeling. Awesome. I mean, awesome. This has been, this has been a, a blessed interview. I've been really enriched. And that's oh, what yeah. it's all about. It's about encouraging, inspiring other artists. And that's right. Continue to paint, continue to draw, continue to be creative so that you can be fulfilled by blessing someone and your art blesses others just as when i say your i'm talking about our art as artists blesses not only people who may not paint but other art a lot of them are not comfortable because on most artists we're they're they're more introvert they're not open they're not open to yes. be out there in the spotlight and then hey that's understandable that's understandable but for the ones that are open out in the spotlight, mainly that's what I'm talking about. The ones that are, are open in the spotlight, you see someone who 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 is uh who has an inspiration to do what you're doing, you should you should encourage them. You should encourage them and 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 to continue to do what they're doing. Cause at the Absolutely. end of the day, they have their own unique artists, they have their own, you know. Everybody's like I said. Everybody's unique and different and everything. So yes. I want to ask you another question. Okay. So, what going back in time, or for what the information you know now as an artist, um, what's something you wish you had known that you that you've learned now? at the beginning oh wow um okay one thing is that other people do not validate your artwork and uh and i think that's where the fear comes in is that we have given as <laughs> artists we have given the viewer permission to validate us and the fact that i have a drive to create which is part of the family business, you know, being the Lord, that's what God does for a living is he creates. And that's, uh, you know, the, the permission comes from this, what, what God has put inside of me, you know, it's kind of like, I gotta be me. Um, a border collie and a pen full of sheep is going to work them. You know, that's, I, you, we, I can't not be me. And I guess it's, if somebody says, well, heck, my dog could do that. Okay, great. You got a talented dog, but I'm not, it doesn't affect me. And uh, something that I heard at one of my, I think it was one of my first workshops back in 2005. And, uh, and the artist, uh, Karen Vance, she was so encouraging she said, I want to tell all of you people in this workshop that only 2% of the artists make a living doing their artwork. And I went home that evening. I told my wife and she said, well, how did that make you feel? And I said, well, like there's not going to be many of us. You know, uh, percentages doesn't mean anything with, you know, with what I was, you know, what we're made to do. And so if I would have to say one thing is other people do not validate uh, what your artwork or even the process, your art journey, because it is a journey. And I have found too, is that so many times somebody will naysay or criticize, not critique, but criticize a growing up, uh, an up and coming artist because uh, frankly, because you intimidate that person because it's something that not everybody wants to do, you know, or can do or will do. And uh, so just being, I'd say being true to your, uh, being true to yourself, true to your heart 
and know that you do have permission. My early paintings, I wished I had one of them here. Um, we're in the middle of moving, so <laughs> everything's in a box. Uh, but my first paintings were the kind of paintings that make you just want to smile. You know, like you, you just kind of wonder if, if they come with a magnet so you could put them on your refrigerator. I mean, they were that kind of, of painting and they were crude, but I learned something in every one of them. And that helps me to figure out, to see my own growth. I keep some from just about every year so I can kind of mark my twain, you know, and I can, can see my growth. Uh, but, you know, even when I was taking my work to a gallery owner in Fredericksburg and he would take one day a year or a couple of hours each year and he would critique my work. And to me, uh, I, I sure appreciated, you know, his constructive criticism. And then I'd work all year trying to get all that other stuff done to things that he said were problems. Well, in a few years, I wound up being in that gallery and it was a national gallery. And he told me, he said, well, Phil Bobby said, when you would leave after our sessions, he said, I would turn to one of the ladies there at the work there at the gallery and said, boy, I hope he's not trying to make a living on that artwork. And thing is I was, and, uh, but to me, no meant simply not yet. If I'm not there. Okay then I'll go home and work harder and I'll work longer. And, and that's the fun of it. It's not the, um, you know, I haven't, there's no such thing as having arrived. You talk to any artist, there's no such thing. You know, every day, that's something that Michael Workman told me. Uh, I was in one of his workshops and we were going to do some plein air painting and, I asked him, I said, hey, Michael, are you going to do a masterpiece? And he said, well, I don't know. I haven't started it yet. And I may just wind up wiping it all off. And I, what? You're, you're internationally known. And he said, but I'm also a pioneer. I've never been here before. So there's that, the terror of a blank canvas all of us have to fake or to face, I mean, and and so and that's what's so, so fun is the challenge of the brand new every day and you know I, I i enjoy it but you but it is an unknown and you don't know when you're going to sell but that you know that's a whole different subject but you know i do it because i can't not paint I, there is even even when I said that, when I laid out and gave my painting up, my my artwork up for ten years, like I said to me, it was for the rest of my life. And I built a fifteen hundred square foot, three level porch outside of my home. You know, I had to create and do something. I because God put it in me, and I do want to say one more thing is to encourage anyone who has a desire to paint or sculpt or draw is that, you know, these desires you didn't put in you, God put them in you. And so I'm bringing glory to God. You're bringing glory to God by just being who he made you to be. And so when I started experimenting and, and working on my art, I was trusting that he did a good thing. You know, that like in Psalms 139, where he says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, that's me. And, and you were saying that earlier, D. And, you know, that's the, the thing is that trusting and doing something that's outside of the box is really poo-pooed on in our culture. But, you know, that is the epitome of diversity is to be creative, to go. I feel like I'm on the Starship Enterprise because I'm going someplace where no man has never gone before on, on every painting. And 
and and your intent will always be seen no matter what you're painting if it's a pursuit of excellence then that will be seen if it'll be if it's glorifying god that will be seen if it's well i paint this and i'll make a lot of money at it that will be seen you know so all of that and uh but anybody no matter where we are in our art journey you have permission if you have the desire the permission's already been granted Awesome. Awesome. You have a few minutes or seconds. Just tell okay. everybody briefly where you, where they can get an urge on a purchase or on a piece of your art. Okay. You bet. Well, I'm in uh, three major galleries right now. Uh, Legacy Gallery in Scottsdale, uh, Arizona. Insight Gallery in Fredericksburg, uh, Texas and uh the cadre gallery in whitefish montana and you can i'm also in several shows but you could go to my website at philbobbormanfineart.com and you can see a link to all of the um of all of the galleries and then we also do commissions and you can contact me through the website there as well i bless you thank you so much and you heard it phil bob borman uh, better known as the Cloud Painter, and he was our guest today. God bless you. We'll see you next time, and be inspired to paint, draw, just stay at it. God bless you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you got something good out of it. Let me know what you think by leaving a comment. Also, don't forget to hit the like button. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at the letter D Weaver Art. Thank you so much. God bless you. See you next time.